so much. I'm so glad to be. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, a huge shout out to Linux Foundation. I'm glad to be speaking at the event. Today, the topic is live hacking session because we're going to be doing some live hacking. And uh, we're going to be talking about weakest line of code as well. So that's what the talk is all about. A bit about myself. OK, here we go. A bit about myself. Uh, I'm a security relations leader at Sneak. I'm also one of the global board of directors at uh, uh, OWASP. I'm also on the review board of Black Hat Asia, Grace Hopper India, and some of the conferences in India like B-Sides uh, Ahmedabad, but B-Sides Delhi. I'm also involved in some of the diversity initiatives like InfoSec Girls, InfoSec Kids, WooSec, to name some of them. Now, if I go ahead and look at the screen, let's take a moment to reflect on this picture. When you look at this photograph, what comes to your mind? Does it look like a futuristic outlook of the world or perhaps the uprising of our robots overload? That happens, right? For me, I ask myself, what are we doing? And then how much, of the day, uh, how much does the robot learn from, uh, about a child or where the information is getting stored? Is it stored safely? Or if it is stored safely, where does the robot get its software updates from? And can this upstream source be compromised? What can happen when it gets compromised? Maybe uh, there is a probability that someone hacks in and can watch the video feed, can talk to the child and see what, what's happening around in the house. There are things that keep me up at night. If you've joined this talk, that means you care about software. You care about software security. Most of all, you are curious like I am, how does open source security or software supply chain impact all of us? If I talk about the, the piece of code that we use in our own applications, how much of a code are we using as a homegrown code or written in-house? Very, very less. And then rest of the code is libraries used in our code. We are using containerized applications. We are using serverless functions. We are using bare-bone EC2 installs. If they bundle up open source dependencies, then the risk is there. Yes, the open source is accelerating. However, with a great adoption comes great responsibility and risk at the same time. And that's what free and open source is going to stay forever with us. Now, when that's going to stay, we have some due diligence to pay for. So Sneak Advisor is something which is helping open source code in recognizing if there are any vulnerabilities and that's totally free to use. That's why I'm mentioning here. Um, now, let me tell you about the Node.js ecosystem. When we all work towards um, responsible disclosure or uh, finding some bugs or reporting some bugs, so Sneak also takes responsibility in reporting Node.js ecosystem vulnerability, vulnerabilities. So if you find a bug in Node.js platform, you can report it and we are managing the disclosure program. Uh, so it's a due, due diligence that we are trying to do for the community. Now we've talked enough about open source, but does that the only thing that we need to care about? How about containers? The problem is using safe images is not very intuitive. Consistently, year after year, we've seen the top Docker images on Docker Hub carrying security vulnerabilities in them by default. Now, the result is Docker images almost always bring down vulnerabilities along the great value that they have. And when we talk about great uh, power, again, great with great power come great responsibility. And that's where we need to be very sure that we are we have the right images. We have the proper images that we are using and not the vulnerable ones. On top of it, we've started using infrastructure as a code. When we say infrastructure as a code, that's why we need developer for security. We need platforms that point out the issues in the form uh, that the, the developers can understand. Earlier, what developers were doing, they were just coding the application and shipping it. And, and trust me, we have done it. Like I used to be a developer at one point and then I moved to security. Now, being on this side, I understand what are the challenges that are there on the developer side. 
One important aspect, if I highlight, now the, the era has changed. There are technologies that have changed. So think about earlier, they were only coding the code. Like they were just writing the code. Now uh, they're taking care of containers. They're getting, taking care of cloud and whatnot, the whole environment they need to take care of. Uh, so it comes with a lot of responsibilities and then we're trying to force upon security on them but why are we trying to do when we say the code that makes up an application has changed the um, in order to maintain the pace which is required to compete in this whole transforming world when we say there's so many things that are coming with a lightning speed so application development has also transformed from developers coding functionality to assembling applications via a combination of proprietary and open source code and even keeping containers and infrastructure as a code in them. So this increases speed, but also risk at the same time. There are vast majority of risk that comes into uh, our overall code base, which is often open source code. Now, which creates a new open, uh, new ownership and security responsibility for the company. And leveraging the software supply chain to stay competitive in the context of this whole digital transformation, Often application security teams focus first on the security system code or custom code, like with the tools like SAST and DAST. That's all good. SAST and DAST we've been following for a very long time. But as this is the code that their development teams are writing, but maybe the primary responsibility is to take care of that. But what happens to the open source code? which quickly becomes the majority of the code. Like when I say 80 to 90% of the code is open source, the vulnerabilities present in these open source code, how are we going to handle it? And especially the vulnerabilities present in the open source codes are known to attackers because it's all out there in the wild. And think about those bots, which are constantly probing to find those opportunity to take advantage of these vulnerabilities. These vulnerabilities are more likely to be found and exploited uh, than just single hacker probing these vulnerabilities and uniquely finding them. No. And on top of it, containers. There are hundreds of packages on the internet which are vulnerable and we're still using it. Talk about infrastructure as a code. If I talk about OWASP itself, OWASP top 10 uh, draft version has just got released. And in that, uh, security misconfiguration is around the top. Now, when it's around the top, that means it, it is of some importance. There's a lot of people who have put in the efforts. There are a lot of organizations who send the data. And similarly, not just OWASP, take the Ponymon Institute research report. That also talks about the same. We need to uh, concentrate on the misconfigurations. It's a one high priority. Now, when we are talking about that, let's rewind back in time to get an early glimpse of how one developer perceived the risk of open source software. So in 1984, the Turing Award winner, Ken Thompson, he wrote an essay titled Reflections on Trusting Trust in which he describes how he added a backdoor to the login, uh, login program. And then he continued and added a backdoor to the C compiler. And then he further continued to chain the attack by backdooring the compiler that compiles the compiler. Interesting. Now, in his revelation of how software can be taught to learn specific traits and then pass them on to their spawns, he explains how software can remain without a trace of a Trojan horse. Now, when we are talking about that, how about developers as a malware distribution system or vehicle, as we are learned by Thompson's Trojan horse story dated back in 1984, where that goes back, long back, where developers have been targeted as a vehicle to distribute malwares. Now, do we still say, see all of these things? Absolutely. Now these things have more increased. Think about Sourceman's SDK. Think about uh, Event Stream followed by Electron Native Notify. And in 2018, the JavaScript ecosystem witnessed its first high impact spearheaded surgical attack targeting maintainers and developers working in open source and themselves being used as an attack vehicle to distribute malicious JavaScript code designed to decrypt itself. And on top of it, run in a specific environment targeting developers of a Bitcoin wallet application. Hmm, that's on that's again even more interesting so this was very well known even stream incident 
Now, if I tell you about the history, Event Stream existed on the NPM JS registry since 2011. Practically, did not receive any release in the last two years, but gained millions of downloads per week. Out of the blue, a person comes in and uh, on the GitHub repositories, opening an issue and wanting to help as it's a customary in open source ecosystem. We all want to help the open source ecosystem. Then further contribute code with several pull requests. And then they create pull requests that act as a dependency into the event stream own package dependency tree, which supposedly intend to improve the code base of the ecosystem. And a few days later or weeks later, what he did, he added a code payload inside the dependencies, which they added, uh, which injects a malware into the specific Bitcoin wallet uh, called Copay. Because the Copay wallet applications use event stream as part of a build process, this has gone unnoticed for almost three months, resulting in two versions released for the Copay Bitcoin app. That's huge. And um, there's an academic research paper published in 2019, which investigated that properties of a language-based software ecosystem and found that 61% of the open source packages on NPM could be considered as abandoned or not in use or maybe not being updated because they did not receive any release in the prior 12 months. And there are people who keep mm, uh, showering their, their bad things on these things, but it is, is it right? Now, when I say it is not right, because what I feel that everyone is trying to contribute to open source in some way or the other. If a project is abandoned, what we can do is we can pick up and help if we feel that yes, it is relevant for the ecosystem. And if we can't do, then I'm sure we need to educate people to, to not use it, but not uh, bad mouth any of these projects. Now, when all of that is right, how much thought uh, are we giving to the security of our own development infrastructure? Resources like the cloud infrastructure, the staging environments, and the build and continuous integration uh, tooling. How much are we concentrating on that? And then how much do we know about the current state of open source security and what it entails for us? If I talk about this classic case of marked cross-site scripting or marked, uh, marked in markdown. So this case study actually goes several years back. Marked is a markdown parser for the web downloaded millions of times a week. One of the most popular libraries for this purpose is the JavaScript and Node.js ecosystem. But one day, a security researcher opened a code pull request which reports and fixes an excess vulnerability. That's a really good thing, which including tests for future code re regressions to uh, the proof of concepts examples. Now on the screen, you would be able to see that, yes, this is the time when the pull request was made. Now, when the pull request was made, interestingly, when the fix was done. So as is with the open source software, the interesting case is that uh, maintainers are really just trying to do their best, but they can't be there all the time. It is not possible. And then there are no legal obligations or contracting obligations for them to support you. So this vulnerabilities, vulnerability was left out in the open with no fix for a year. That's a long time, very, very long time. This security issue was uh, um, proposed, code fix was opened in 2015, but the only merge was done in 2016. Now, cherry on top of a cake, when we are all so much independent or so much dependent on open source software, we can't ignore the question of where do we put our trust and what are our mitigation strategies and security controls to cope up with the risks involved. In 2017, a security researcher with the Node.js Foundation conducted a research in which he wanted to assess the state of weak NPM credentials used by the maintainers. His work revealed the devastating truth of developers' lack of security hygiene. The security researcher was able to gain uh, and publish access to 14% of NPM JS ecosystem modules. That's a huge one. Now, some of these modules are downloaded tens of millions of times a week and are essential and key part of the thriving JavaScript ecosystem. The problem was rooted with insecure passwords chosen by, um, chosen by the well-known maintainer accounts. 
such as literally the word password. Who does that now? Now, let me put it across to you in a way wherein I'm sure all of you would be using toothbrushes. And I also, I'm also positive that you would not be sharing your toothbrush with anyone. Like I don't share my toothbrush with anyone. So passwords are like toothbrushes. When you don't share your toothbrush and it is unique to you, why can't we keep our password unique and a big one which people can't remember or use a passphrase, right? So what could have happened if a malicious person would have got access to it? So many things that could have happened, right? If a malicious person would have done it. And if our code packages can reach thousands or millions of developers, shouldn't we have more protection in place? And as people around software security or open source security, can we do better for our own account security hygiene? Maybe yes. So now when NPM, the largest registry of open source software packages spanning like 1.5 million packages to date has supported two-factor authentication since the end of 2017. Despite all the security incidents and compromised accounts happening throughout recent years, in 2019, only 7.1% of NPM packages maintainers have enabled multi-factor authentication. And unfortunately, this is the case with almost every ecosystem that we see. And the software supply chain security story isn't uh, resonating enough with the developers. We still see that there are only few, like there's a bit of percentage that has increased in the multi-factor authentication. Now, as part of the security ecosystem, I can say that humans often represent the weakest link in the whole chain. Now, when they do that, uh, there was a term which was coined by Linus Law back in 1999 by, uh, and by Eric uh, Rain, Raymond. Now, if I'm not wrong, now, he said the cathedral and the bazaar, in which he explored the difference between software development which is executed within the open source movement and, uh, and that of enterprises and formerly organized companies. Now, he also stated that large number of developers and users which use software, they use it with a flaw. Now, when that's there, in, two, in January 2021, it was discovered that sudo, a common utility, which is installed on many Linux distributions, has a security vulnerability. Now, what is that? Which is, a heap-based buffer overflow in sudo. Now, what that does is, specifically, if any unprivileged user is there, they can gain access to the root access just based on the sudo configuration or default sudo configuration. And on top of it, what is it so daunting about this vulnerability is that it is hiding in the clean site for a decade, like 10 whole years. That's like humongous. And in January 21, 2021, a security researcher broke into Microsoft Visual Studio Code GitHub repository, essentially providing him with the capabilities of making code modification. Interesting to know that. Now to the popular and very well loved IDE that many developers use, and even I still use it, I'm gonna use it today as well as part of the demo. And by using that, there was a command injection flaw that was made possible as a valid attack vector due to the flawed regular expression in that. Now, simply by opening a new code pull request, the researcher was able to execute code that the VS Code CI scripts were running without requiring any sort of uh, authentication or authorization checks. This led to remote servers, re re reverse shells on the CI servers, and from there on, the ability to gain push and write access to the repositories source code. That seems so interesting to me. I love doing all of this. And fortunately, the researcher responsibly reported the flaw to Microsoft before advancing, like before advanced threat actors could exploit it. Now, when I say Visual Studio Code, there are about 14 million monthly active users, like so much of download. And we have reached a point where we take open source for granted. Open source registries are open in the nature and allow developers to openly push their packages to it. Now, we have some come uh, accustomed, we've become so accustomed to opening an issue in a project's open source code repository and asking for help, asking for a feature, asking to get our bug fixed for us. 
we import open source libraries to our projects. Now, that's what I've seen. I am trying to compile a code and uh, while compiling, I realized that I am missing out on a, a library. What I'm gonna go, do, go to the internet and download it. Wow, that's so interesting. And that's when uh, comes a point that if maintainers remove their dependencies from the registries, that is exactly the story of what happened in 2016. A maintainer uh, which had tens of his open source packages from um, no, no, NPMJS, one of them was very pivotal package in the ecosystem and failing to download it, now resulting in a widespread package of CIs and install processes. And at the very least, what we learned from it, the weakness is how business fail to manage these open source software and expose the soft spot. And on top of it, how registries did not foresee this on the problem or as a problem, and so we're not uh, designed to handle these kind of things. Now, I have so much of a, um, uh, so many libraries which are there in the ecosystem and I suddenly pull my hand off and things will start to fall apart. That's gonna be very, very tricky. And what kind of malicious activities and assets can we track back to the open source systems? What's inside these registries? Time after time, we find more and more malicious packages hitting the NPM eco uh, NPMJS ecosystem. And if you accidentally install one of them, what will happen? You wouldn't even get to know. You wouldn't even be able to find it out that there's something which is happening. And malicious packages aren't just a thing on the JavaScript ecosystem, they're everywhere. And on March 2021, more than 3,000 malicious packages were published in the PyPy registry. Mm. To further show on how attackers can harness open source to their advantage, Alex Burson published his research in February 2021 about how he exploited design flaws and package managers, registries, and human error to infiltrate, infiltrate into uh, corporations such as Apple, Microsoft, and many more. Now, when all of this is happening, I would like to leave you with the thoughts or questions to ponder upon. Are we going to have less or more software in the future? Or are we going to use uh, less or more open source software? And on top of it, who do we trust? Do we trust them? Or are we missing out on something? Now, let me give you a brief of what I have talked about Developers often think about the security of their app in terms of vulnerabilities that lay into the open source dependencies. Now, your open source dependencies footprint is great start to improve this, um, the application security posture because open source components make up to 90% of the code. But what lies beyond that? So much more. So what do we see next? Hmm, let's go ahead and have the environment. All right, let me go ahead and show you something interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna be doing a role play here and that's what I like about. So I'm gonna be a developer, I'm gonna be an attacker. I, I, I try not use the term hacker because we all are trying to hack our own applications and secure our organization. So I'll use the term attacker and avoid using hacker to the most, but I still use sometimes. So as a developer, that's the first role that I'm going to be using. Here, if you can see on my screen, I have Visual Studio Code, which I love, which I love totally because I it, it gives me um, wings to move around, set up my own web application. Now, here, my code is there, and then I use a lot of extensions. So let me go ahead and show you one extension, which is called Instant uh, Instant Markdown. I'm sure some of you would be using Instant Markdown because it's good to use, it's good to have. So while I go here, it says Instant Markdown and the version is 1.4.6 and see the number of downloads. That's huge, crazy. And it's asking me to update it to 1.4.7, interestingly. Now, I don't want to update right now. I have a lot of work to do. I don't want to close my uh, Visual Studio code. I'll update it. Mm -hmm. I'll take time and update it. That's fine. Now, I'll, I'll reverse the role. I become an attacker. 
Now, why, while I become an attacker, there is an interesting thing, interesting take here. What it is, is that I am going to be going ahead. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so I'm going to be going here and hosting a website. Tell me one thing. If I ask you to, to go to my website, so let me just do it itself. I have a website called InfoSec Vandana. Now, you know me from this session, so you might would like to open my website. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe not. But some of you might go through that. I have a beautiful website, which is plain, simple, nothing more. Now, when that's there, I become your friend. Now, I'll share a link with you. I'll say, I have something very nice on this website. Hmm. You might go and try. But what it is, I'll show you here. So here I have a PHP server running on my local host. I'm using ngrok to, uh, to make sure that my subdomain goes to uh, the local host and I can host my application. And this is my simple code. So now when I've given you that details, I'll ask you to open that, which is infosec vandana.ngrok.io. And you will try and open. Now it's a not secure code. I would not open any not secure application ever. It's bad. Now, when I've done it, there's something which is running. It says, you've been hacked, there's nothing more. What were you trying to say? Okay, now let me go back and see my code. Is there something which is interesting, which is coming? Hmm. No, nothing which has come. Let's see, okay, nothing. Now here I'm running a plugin, which is called uh, Instant Markdown Plugin. Now, if I use this in Instant Markdown Plugin, and then try and load the application. Now, as a tacker, I, I have this application set up. As a developer, you have something running, right? Uh, so when I am trying to do that, you have, you've been thinking, okay, there's nothing which is wrong. But think about from perspective wherein you have something in your system which is running an older Markdown plugin. Now, you're using that. Is this something that I can get from your system? Maybe, maybe not. So let's see. Hmm, okay, I can see something which is happening here. My PHP server is also giving me some inputs. Uh, yeah, so it's the exact time if you see. And now I can see something beautiful here. So there's a file which has come which says, can't touch this password. As an attacker, I got this file. But if I am a developer, from where I've got this file, uh, like um, I've got this file from a developer's account. Now, again, if I go back to the uh, developer role, interestingly, what I can see here, let me go ahead and show Alice. There is a password file. And generally we keep a lot of keys file here. What it says, can't touch this password. Now I'm an attacker and I got this file but I can fetch as much as information I want, which is slang over in the home directory. There's much more which I can fetch, I can get it from here. So the most important piece is that let's keep our ecosystem up to date. I, I totally love this Jeff where she keeps trying to do the, to hack the environment. Now, now I don't wanna talk about my presentation. I wanna show you something more. Now, while we are talking about it, so, let me go ahead, come uh, to let me see. Now this is like, I keep trying to do the demos before every session. So for before this, this session also, I was trying to do something and I left it open. Oh, that's what I do. Because a lot of times demo goats don't, don't shower their blessings on us. So now here, I hope they do. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let's see if what works. Oh, it works. Now, let me build the whole scene. I'm a person who likes to make list, like literally one, two, three, four, five, six, because I tend to forget things. And now we are all virtual, so it's even more wherein I forget things. Okay, now what exactly do I want here? Interestingly, I want to have this particular website which helps me with making to-do list. Uh, I'm new here, so I'm gonna make I'm gonna make a registration here. I'll say Vandana 
okay, I'll say, no, I don't want to put my email address. So you got access to my email address. So I'm going to say, uh, okay, that's that's the wrong name. I'll say Linux. Da, da, da. Password, A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. Never use this password. As I said, never ever use this password. Now, why I say that? Because it's the most insecure password that you can ever use it. And that's why I'm telling you, never use insecure passwords. It's bad to use. And that's why I use password manager, which is gonna pop up, which I'm gonna say not now because I'm gonna use it for demo and I'm gonna clean it up. Now, here comes my to-do list. In my to-do list, I have homework home, which is like, okay, this one. Then I have my account, which shows my name, email address, and a few other things. Then this is a beautiful place where I can create my to-do list. And I can upload files. I can see my files, where once I upload the files, I, it reaches here. So let's go ahead and create a to-do list. So I will say, first list. And I will go ahead and select a date, hmm, 30th. I'm going to select 30th and I have created. Interesting. Now I like to be a hacker. So I'll say one that is a hacker and I'll select the date where it's here. Great. Hmm. I love it. My demo is going good. But let's see what else I want here. Now, all of this is good. I'll go to about. I'll see, oh, what it is here in the about. I have about homepage, I can see a GitHub repo, then I can see a license, which is there. Then I can see some frameworks. Idly, you wouldn't find any frameworks listed in the website, which is not, which is like a not so good thing to list because if I know what version you're using of what thing, I will exploit it. That's what I want. You're giving me the information, you're giving me the key to your house and then I can see that there is a version which is the older strat version, which was vulnerable and which was involved in a very well-known breach. Interesting. Now, as a malicious person, I have some exploits, which I want to use and upload some files. Let's go ahead and choose files. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to goof and I'm going to go to exploits and I'm going to upload this exploit. So this is zip slip um, exploit which I'm going to upload. Or think about, hmm, simple, uploaded. Do I see anything else? Nothing, as usual. I said, nothing, nothing happened. Nothing happened to my exploit, which I was running. So I went back to create a to-do list. And this time I'll say, one that is not a hacker. I'll select a date, which seems not so good, but yes. I couldn't upload a zip file. So I'll say, let me create a list. But this time, what do you see? You cannot see the same thing. One is not a hacker. It says, hmm, gotcha. Something has happened. So something happened with my exploit. Let me create a to-do list again. One is a hacker. And again, yes. Now I create it. If you see, I have this on both the sides. Now, why? Let me come back to our presentation and show you. So this is what happened with the Equifax breach. And why does it matter? Because known vulnerabilities are where the hackers attack because they, they can be weaponized exploits and exploits against hundreds and hundreds of or thousands of targets. Now, and the time window sometimes is very short. If you look at what happened with the Ap Apache Struts vulnerability like a couple of years ago, the famous vulnerability which led to Equifax breach, we all still remember it because this was one of the biggest breach. And there was only one day between a fix was released and vulnerability was disclosed or the exploit being made available. And then only about two weeks between them and the time attacks started to pour in uh, into the Struts. Now, if you have the ability to quickly find and fix this vulnerability, the, the, the issues wouldn't have occurred. But there are times when we cannot just go ahead and say, oh, this vulnerability, I'm just going to go ahead and fix it. I'm just going to go ahead and update it. It's not so easy. There is a patching cycle, but it shouldn't be a very, very long cycle. So it's critical that we detect the issues fast. We make sure that we respond to them 
and we do it at scale so that we do it over and over again. We do it on our, all our applications. And because again, again, the majority of our software is open source and will have vulnerabilities, we need to keep a track of it. This has happened with me where I was working for one of the companies and they did not have a proper repository of all the applications. They were maintaining the enterprise library, but then after it, what has happened? There was no update on what are the versions which we're using. And we had sleepless nights managing that, like literally. And on top of it, what happens if we don't manage our developer ecosystem? And extensions power the ecosystem for the developers. Now, of course, many of these are built using the open source vulnerabilities that would just be released. And meaning think about the, the vulnerable plugins like Instant Markdown 1.4.6, open in default browser 2.1.3, Rainbow Fort 1.4.0 and many more. Now, this is the vulnerability that I was showcasing you, which is like the simplest one. But if you look at this, uh, there is a uh, there's a link that will be shared with you where you can actually reproduce this vulnerability yourself and see how these extensions can be really, really tricky and critical. Now, one thing to remember, be aware of what we install in our dev environment. It's very, very important to have a good documentation. If we don't have a good de documentation, it's always gonna be a problem for us. And always be scanning. Now, what are we gonna be scanning? Source code, containers, infrastructure, and so much more. So it's very, very important to maintain. And before I go, we have Linux uh, uh, Foundation conferences going on where I'm speaking. And we also have a sneak con coming up next week. So you can join us. So it's open for everyone to join. And there are so many security sessions, Devisic Ops session around there, which is there. Now, the most important of all that I said, we have superpowers of code. So let's code it security and be good to each other. That's very, very important. Thank you so much. I wanted to make it short so we can, we can take up questions in the end. If you have any questions, do feel free to reach me and um, or post it in the q and I'll be happy to have a conversation. Okay, so there is a question that I can see in the question, uh, question and answer. Hello, Vandana. What do you think of Redux, the state of management framework for React, allowing end user to inspect the application data single using the Redux Dev tool? Now, see, uh, I have one thing to remember. It's not about React or it's not about NPM. I just explained it the way, but the, the key lies is that we need to use these softwares because th these are good to use, these are amazing, and the one thing which goes behind with it is that we maintain a list of it. We keep a track of it. If there is a new update, new patch that comes in, we keep updating it. That's the crux. Please feel free to type any question which is there. I'll be happy to take up any question. Okay, folks, if anybody has a question, you can drop it in the Q&A. Um, give it another moment here. See, till the time you ask questions, I'm gonna be here. Like literally, I'm gonna be here and keep it open. Wow. 
or what I can do is I can also post uh, my social media details. If you want to connect with me, I'll be happy to have a conversation around uh, anything open source. And I'm sure a lot to learn from all of you as well who are joining the session. So I'll be happy to have a conversation around that. Vandana, it does look like another question just came in. Yes, let me just take a look at it. All righties. Okay, so what are the most common vulnerabilities we should be protecting our ISDs from? Now, the first thing I would say is that we need to maintain infrastructure as a code for misconfiguration. That's like the huge thing. And IAC comes with its own pros and cons, but the first and the last being uh, the security misconfiguration. It's very, very important. And what access we are trying to give, because if we don't maintain that, then it's going to be a big, big challenge for all of us. And I have seen wherein uh, the vulnerabilities come in ISC because we are writing this form and we are just missing out on updating uh, the right set of permissions. Like it's a huge one. And it's just the beginning. But if uh, we don't uh, have these default configurations, then we can save our environment to a greater extent, like literally to a greater extent. But in understanding what nodes we are spinning, what kind of uh, uh, access we are gonna be giving to the node, when are, when are we gonna use specific function, what privileges are we gonna give, and what we are using these. Uh, so I see what I've seen that it is being uh, used from the predefined templates. Now, when it's used from the predefined templates, then that means there are default configurations. A lot of time we tend to miss out on them. And uh, another important aspect is when we are defining these templates, let's use the updated version of the software. It's very important. And um, what else? We can actually monitor it via central system. We can have like a continuous cycle where we keep monitoring all of these things. And Sneak has open source components, which you like, if you like to leverage, then you can actually go ahead and register yourself at sneak.io. There's an open source component that you can use. There are many products which covers the software code, uh, the open source component, and alongside the containers and other things. I hope this answers your question. Okay, so there is, a, there is a question which says, are there any reliable sources, resources like websites, et cetera, which list new vulnerabilities in the packages? So for every ecosystem, uh, there are new packages, let's say for uh, containers, there, there are uh, places where it's listed with the right images. For Node NPMJS ecosystem, yes, there is a resource where you, you see new and updated vulnerabilities. For Java ecosystem, there is a place where you see it. Even though uh, there are websites like ThreatPost and many other websites which keep publishing all of these uh, and uh, you can access it. Uh, let me go ahead and share some of these with you so that it can be useful for you. I will just share the links so that it will be helpful for you. And even let me go ahead and share the sneak link where we generally um, have the sneak uh, disclosure program and sneak vulnerability database, which is like a huge one. And there are so many um, people who actually can get benefited out of it. There are, there are researchers who are working on it, which keeps updating uh, what are the new vulnerabilities which are coming and in which ecosystem, Go, Maven, CocoaPods, uh, and, on top of it, let me tell you interestingly, when we are managing this ecosystem, we also uh, have just integrated a new plugin, which is around uh, Twitter trending. I loved it because if there is any vulnerability which is trending on Twitter, you can just go ahead and go to the portal and check out which one is on the top or it comes on the top and tells you that yes, this is the vulnerability which is stopping the charts right now. I hope this answers. Do you recommend any vulnerability tools? 
I'm a huge fan of open source. So I can recommend uh, for software composition analysis sneak and uh, OWASP dependency check. And then if I have to talk about DAST, which is dynamic application security testing, then, uh, then OWASP ZAP is one amazing place to uh, tool to use. And at the same time, Burp Suite is amazing. The, like I use the community version. Uh, they are like, they have commercial as well. And there are many tools in the market. I'm going to be here. Please uh, feel free to ask your questions. And if there's anything, I'll be happy to answer any of those questions. And it looks like another one came into the Q&A. Sure, I'll just check. Okay, so what does detecting vulnerabilities in your system look like? What kind of design principles? See, detecting fast and detecting is like you have the tools and technologies, but we need to map it right. If we don't map it right, we would never be able to detect. If we talk about ecosystem where we were using Apache. Now, if I don't know the version, I'll keep looking at it. And even I might not even recognize that there is a flaw that has come in. So it's very important to understand all of this, that what are the things which are currently in, in place and how I can leverage it to the best. So let's understand that this is our ecosystem. This is my world. And, and on top of it, let me tell you one a very important thing. There are a lot of organizations which have public facing applications, public facing service, and a lot of them are not being managed. A lot of code on the code, it's like a lot of open source code in the code is not even used. Now, why are we doing it? And what kind of design principle? The design principle always follows and depends on the kind of environment we have. If I tell you that this is the kind of principle, no, it's not going to be sufficing because no two organization can have the similar architecture. But yes, it the, the first step is to get to know the, our assets. Like that's the first thing. If we get to know, then we can lay down the procedure. This is where we want security. This is where how we want the, our DevSecOps to be. This is how I want my environment to be. And that's when we would be able to detect if any adversary comes into picture and uh, uh, respond to it. And as well as we'll be able to mitigate that early on. Because if we don't understand our ecosystem, we don't have the right tools, or even if we have the right tools, but they're not stitched together. Like there is a SIM solution, there's a vulnerability solution. They're not even speaking with each other. There is no correlation. There's so much going on in the back end. It's gonna be a big trouble. So understanding our own ecosystem can help in designing the right principle. That's what I feel. Because every organization has a different architecture. Okay, wonderful. Don't see any more questions in the Q&A for right now. So um, we just want to say thank you so much for Vandana for her time today. And thank you to everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. So you can view it again or share it with a friend. Um, and we hope that you will join us for future webinars. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.